Okay. Okay. Well, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Frank von Hippel, and uh, Bruce Blair and I are both with the program on science and global security, uh, which is a uh, research program associated with the Woodrow Wilson School, uh, and uh, we'll uh, give, you, give an overview of our concerns about nuclear weapons uh, and uh, in general, but uh, the doomsday machine in general, but, uh, you know, there, there's uh, both uh, special dangers and special opportunities associated with uh, the Trump administration, and, and uh, we'll, we'll tr discuss those. So uh, I'm going to just give a an overview, um, a perspective on uh, with the PowerPoint, uh, and then uh, Bruce will uh, talk about the um, dangers of use, I guess, primarily, uh, and uh, and then we'll try to leave half the time for disc discussion and what, what we can do about it. So uh, I'll, I'll just talk about the current situation, you know, what we have, uh, uh, the, the fact that uh, there's a program underway, uh, started in the Obama administration to modernize everything we have, uh, and it's, it's also happening in other countries. Uh, the perversity of ballistic missile defense and whether, in fact, all the um, uh, activism that the Trump administration has generated uh, actually provides an opportunity to do something about some of these issues. So this, this is uh, where we've been and where we are in terms of the size of the U.S., the number of warheads in the U.S. nuclear stockpile. You see, it, it, we had more than 30,000 uh, at the peak uh, in, the, in the 1960s. We're down now to about 4,000. We've come down a long ways uh, from the Cold War peaks, but in fact, um, as it'll become clear, uh, 4,000 is more than enough to ruin your day. Uh, the, this, this, the global situation is shown here. Uh, U.S. and Russia are, are still uh, dominate the, the picture of the of the of the uh, about ten thousand warheads uh, globally. Uh, the, the U.S. and Russia between them have about nine thousand, uh, and so the arms control has been a U.S. Soviet now U.S. Russia activity, and it could be. Uh, continue that way uh, until we get down to maybe around a thousand warheads. When at which point, all, you know, uh, most of the or, or all of the other countries uh, would have to be involved for, thing, for things to go further. Um, to give you a perspective, uh, this is uh, what the the areas of destruction. Uh, would be for a so average nu uh, modern nuclear warhead on Princeton with that little green box there in the middle is the university, the whole university. Uh, and the uh, two circles, one represents the area destroyed by blast, the red area and the, and the yellow area uh, for, by fire. So, so um, you can see that uh, being in a world of 10,000 warheads still is not uh, a comfortable place to be. Uh, now, why do we have so many? Uh, so first approximation is because they're aimed at each other. The U.S. and the, and the Russian warheads are aimed at each other. Uh, this is a scenario in which, uh, you know, done by uh, uh, the, uh, a group within the Natural Resources Defense Council, uh, where uh, there, there would be um, uh, about 2,000 U.S. warheads uh, attacking uh, uh, Russian missile fields, bomber bases, uh, communication links, uh, uh, submarine bases, and so on. And they, they tried to estimate how many people would be killed. I think their, their calculations were conservative. They, they eight, 8 to 15 million they calculated. But of course, that's just the direct, the, the direct deaths from the um, blast, 
fire and radioactive fallout that the you know there would I think there would be many more uh, as a result of the collapse of the of the of the society and uh, if, assuming that they reciprocated of the global global um, uh, system uh, now there's a plan to modernize uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, system, uh, uh, which is based on intercontinental ballistic missiles, which are in, in missile silos in the, in, the, in the Great Plains, ballistic missile submarines, long-range bombers with, with cruise missiles, uh, and that's about a half a trillion dollar uh, uh, program over the next 20 years. Uh, this creates a political opportunity that arms controllers and and uh, fiscal hawks could could uh, could wonder whether all this is necessary. Whether it's necessary to keep all this, you can see the um, the three the two historical peaks of investment in U.S. nuclear weapons uh, in the Kennedy Johnson administration and the Reagan administration, and now this forthcoming peak and and the military is quite concerned uh, about the trade-offs between uh, nuclear weapons, which they consider unusable, and conventional weapons, which, which they feel like they need. Uh, one of the systems in particular that uh, uh, a number of us have, have uh, argued uh, could go and should go are the intercontinental ballistic missiles. Uh, these are uh, there are about uh, 400 of these, uh, and they're targetable. Uh, you know, you can see them on Google Earth. Uh, uh, and as a result, the uh, strategic command keeps them in a launch on warning posture, uh, which, which means that if uh, our satellites, early warning satellites or radars, pick up um, uh, indications uh, of an incoming attack, that the president would be asked to, to decide within a few minutes whether to launch these things before they could be destroyed. Uh, there have been false alarms uh, on both sides, uh, which have uh, fortunately not gone all the way to launch on warning. Um, then on ballistic missile defense are, is actually become a major obstacle to uh, nuclear reductions uh, in our conversations with, with Russia and with China. Uh, the, the perversity of ballistic missile defense is that it's easy to see how they, uh, for, for very quite low cost, uh, they, it could be neutralized. Uh, and this is just an example where, where you put a, 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 a luminized balloon around a, a warhead and put up lots of other luminized balloons and, you, and you've got a shell game and, and uh, you quickly multiply the number of targets beyond what, what you, uh, the number of interceptors you have. Um, now, um, well, now, now we, as you know, and Bruce will get into, I'll just skip over this because Bruce, <laughs> Bruce will say more about this. So the, the, the final slide uh, is really uh, my, the positive, uh, what posit positively might come out of this uh, is the, um, from the activism, if some of, it, some of the activism we're seeing in the country can be channeled into uh, trying to push this, uh, uh, the nuclear arms control agenda forward. Uh, this, is, this is a precedent uh, where at the beginning of the Reagan administration, uh, uh, the, the public became scared of what the Reagan administration might do, that they might start a nuclear war. There was a nuclear weapons freeze movement. Uh, this is a picture from a, a demonstration in New York, including uh, Barack Obama someplace in there, uh, and, uh, uh, which, uh, and there were similar demonstrations in Europe, uh, and, uh, and the, the result was a change in the politics of arms control. Uh, 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 Reagan uh, just, uh, changed his the subject to uh, Star Wars, the ballistic missile defense, and then uh, to negotiations with the Soviet Union. Uh, Gorbachev in Moscow, uh, the new uh, 
general secretary in Moscow uh, concluded that maybe the U.S. wasn't run by a military industrial complex after all. Maybe negotiations might be possible and, and the rest is history. So with that, I'll turn it, turn it over to Bruce. I never mastered the art of PowerPoints, so I'm just going to speak to you today. Hope that's okay. I'm going to build um, on Frank's talk in three areas. The authority of the president to order the use of nuclear weapons. That's one. The system or the process by which that uh, order is arrived at and carried out. That's two. And three is uh, so, uh, so, um, talk, give some thoughts, uh, share some proposals on um, checks and balances that we might establish uh, in both of those first two arenas, checks and balances on the president and checks and balances on the process. Um, so regarding authority, the, uh, the president has carte blanche. It's, he's virtually a, a nuclear monarch. It's absolute power over the use of nuclear weapons. Uh, no one can veto him. There is no, no protocol that requires a confirmation from the Secretary of Defense or from some other authority in the National Security Council, etc. This authority is vested in the President as Commander-in-Chief according to Article 2 of the U.S. Constitution, and there's virtually no constraint. The closest I think you can come is the War Powers Resolution Act, uh, War Powers Re Resolution in of 1973, which requires that the President uh, notify Congress if he commits U.S. military forces to combat um, and to notify them within 48 hours of that commitment. That's not really uh, uh, a serious constraint on the use of nuclear weapons. Um, so, yet, yet an interesting question is, who, who is the president? Uh, in a conflict or a confrontation, who is the president if um, the sitting elected person in the White House is incapacitated? Can the president pre-delegate his authority to other individuals? You quickly enter into pretty murky territory when you start to talk about the authority of the president. Um, a couple of relevant short points here. During the Cold War, every president from Eisenhower through Reagan pre-delegated his nuclear authority to a group of generals and admirals. Uh, I used to work for one out in Omaha, Nebraska. There were a set of conditions under which that, ex that authority could be exercised. Obviously, in general, we're talking about situations where uh, the president is cut off from the nuclear chain of command and related problems. This authority, this pre-delegation was rolled back at the end of the Cold War in our exuberance and uh, sense that uh, danger had, had uh, gone away. And so, um, in a way, we, if you think about the presidential, the protection of the president in a Cold War sort of mindset, we exposed ourselves after the end of the Cold War to potential decapitation because we didn't have this extensive de decentralization. So to protect the president, um, a very serious plan was developed under the Reagan administration called Continuity of Government, and its purpose is to ensure that the president or his legal successor, uh, not a general or an admiral, but his legal su uh, successor is stipulated by the Presidential Succession Act of 1947, can sur that one of those successors can survive under all circumstances. Um, so it's called the COG, Continuity of Government, and the first, and to my knowledge, only time it was ever activated. Can you imagine when? It was in 1990, it was 9-11, just after 9-11. 75 to 150 senior bureaucrats from each of the departments evacuated to pre-designated covert locations. 
Uh, it's a process that's run by one military command today called Northern Command. Um, and when it was activated in, uh, on 9-11, um, 2001, not 1991, um, President Bush was trapped in this plan. He was whisked off to various locations, sort of wound up in Omaha at the headquarters of the Strategic uh, Command. And he had to uh, exert considerable willpower in order to extricate himself from this plan to get uh, back to, uh, to Washington and take, uh, take more leadership of the country after the attack. So this is my segue to the second talk, topic, which is this process by which a nu nuclear strike would be ordered up. Um, and um, this is also a process that can trap the president and exert tremendous pressure on the president to, uh, to make a decision to use nuclear weapons. So in a sense, we're really confronted with two questions here and really two questions of sort of veto, um, the veto power on the use of nuclear weapons. Number one, should we have more checks and balances on, on the President of the United States? Um, but also, should we have a system, a protocol, a command arrangement that allows uh, the, the President more time to deliberate uh, on uh, uh, the decision to use nuclear weapons? So I think the most sort of stressful scenario you can imagine for the president would be one in which uh, an attack appears to be underway against the United States. And let me just briefly describe uh, how that process would work, how a decision would be reached and executed to use nuclear weapons. There's a group of, uh, of, uh, <coughs> of uh, officers located in Colorado at an early warning hub that 24-7 receive data from our satellites and our ground radar that pick up indications of a potential attack against North America. Every day they pick something up. It could be a North Korean missile test, it could be the Russians launching a Scud into Chechnya, it could be the Japanese launching a civilian rocket to put a satellite into space. Even wildfires sometimes set it off. Two or three times a day this team has to evaluate wh whether we're under attack and it is required to report its confidence on whether an event is, represents a threat to the United States within three minutes of the receipt of the first indications of such an event, three minutes. Every couple of weeks something happens where they have to take a second and closer look and once in, once in a blue moon, uh, all hell breaks loose because it, there's uh, indications that look really uh, like an attack is underway. They report their confidence. If it's medium or high, then the president uh, is uh, notified and a special emergency teleconference is convened that involves his key nuclear advisors. He's patched into uh, the headquarters of Strategic Command in Omaha. He's patched into his Secretary of Defense, his state, National Security Advisor, et cetera, et cetera. They may be with him in a crisis in the Situation Room, or if this came out of the blue, they may be widely dispersed. Um, at that point, the President receives a briefing from the head of the Strategic Command in Omaha who tells him the nature of the threat and what his, uh, uh, what his response options in, uh, are and what the consequences of those options are. Uh, it's, a, it's a very um, heavy responsibility to do this and um, depending on the circumstances, that briefing could last no more than 30 seconds. Uh, remember, if, there, if there's a missile attack against the United States, these missiles are flying uh, from one side of the planet to the other in 30 minutes. The warheads are flying at about four miles per second. There ain't a lot of time. Uh, this process has to be very streamlined, and it is. It's designed to extract a decision from the president, and, and under most circumstances, um, most scenarios, the, the time allowed is no more than about six minutes. 
If the president um, decides to order the use of weapons, he has to then use a code in his possession or in, in the uh, possession of his military aid in his so-called briefcase, the, the gold codes, are also, it's also called the biscuit. He identifies himself to the war room in the Pentagon, and if that code matches up properly, it's, uh, then the decision of the president is accepted by the war room and it is immediately transmitted into, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, transformed or formatted into a launch message. That launch message is the length um, of a tweet. It has all the information that everybody needs, the option, the war plan, the timing of the attack, unlock codes so that crews down the chain of the command can uh, unlock their weapons to fire them, the submarines, the bombers and the underground launch officers. Um, all of that is in, in the tweet, uh, and it's transmitted almost instantly to the forces down the chain of, uh, of, the command, of command. I served as a Minuteman launch officer, and we weren't called Minuteman for nothing. We, we had a checklist that took one minute to carry out. We received the order, we compared codes um, to those in our safe, we unlocked our missiles and fired them according to the plan that had been selected by the president. Now, I describe this whole process end to end as, as the enactment, the rote enactment, actually, of a prepared script, and it is. It's all checklisted from beginning to end, including the, the presidential process. Um, and there's very high expectation that the president, under these circumstances, would not with, would not decide to withhold retaliation, but in fact would uh, order the use of nuclear weapons through the process that I just described. Um, so we have uh, a president who would be very hard pressed to extricate himself from the sort of, I think, inexorable momentum of this process to unleash, unleash the nuclear forces. And by the same token, there is no one in this process that can veto, uh, veto the president and his decision. So the system, uh, I think, is substantially rigged to go off. So uh, this is my segue to the last topic, which is uh, how about building in some better checks and balances into both the authority of the president and the system that I describe, um, uh, checks and balances on a hair trigger pres president and a hair trigger system, you might say. So um, I would begin uh, with the easiest task, and that's to restructure the process so that no president has to decide the fate of the planet in six minutes or less. And uh, that starts with getting rid of vulnerable forces that have to currently have to be fired first or very early on warning in order for them to survive. And that means we get rid of the underground launch uh, control centers and missiles in the Midwest of the United States that are vulnerable and cannot survive an attack. If we got rid of them, um, preferably through negotiations with the Russians, then we effectively uh, reduce or even eliminate the hair trigger process that I described. Now, uh, another approach, and I think this could be harder, would be to try to uh, require the president to consult prior to at least the first use of nuclear weapons. Consult with whom? Um, this is a, <coughs> uh, um, this is a very politically difficult thing to do because of the. Uh, authority vested in the president by the Constitution, but there are ideas floating out there that uh, are worthy of consideration. One of them is uh, currently on the table, has been proposed by Congressman Liu and Senator Markey, which is uh, to require the president to get a declaration of war from the president before uh, using nuclear weapons first. Um, the logic being that the use of nuclear weapons would be tantamount to waging war and the Congress is responsible for declaring war under Article I of the 
the Constitution. Therefore, um, we should have a requirement along these lines. Um, an alternative would be to require the president to consult with uh, the chain, the, those down the chain of command in the presidential succession, and that runs from from uh, him to the vice president, spe speaker of the house, head of the senate to the cabinet in, their, in the order of their creation, that's state, treasury, defense, attorney general, all the way down to homeland security. I can imagine having a protocol that would involve the president consulting at least with his vice president and then the two top leaders of the Congress who are, in, who are next in the cha chain of uh, legal presidential succession. Um, now, uh, you know, it's open to your thoughts and proposals. It's, uh, it's something that has, it's, a, it's an issue that has arisen, I think, largely because of questions about the temperament of the current president and the wish on the part of many to see um, that his authority would be constrained in some meaningful way and that uh, he would not be a nuclear monarch. This problem exists Globally, I, I think except in Israel, where there are, I, I believe there is a very strong consultation process in place for the use of nuclear weapons. But beyond Israel, then, there are seven other nuclear countries. Um, I think we have a problem of, of, of temperament, of, uh, of um, uh, un, unconstrained, unfettered authority in those other countries. And if we had the time, I would happily... Uh, uh, dig into the doomsday machine that exists in Russia and China and elsewhere because in indeed uh, there are serious, serious problems of inadvertent, accidental, or unauthorized use of nuclear weapons in all nine of the, all nine of the nuclear weapons countries. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much, both of you, for really enlightening. Um, we have a problem. I mean, we have a lot of problems. But first of all, if Congress declare is the only um, place that they can declare war, right? Is, is the Congress the place where they would decide whether how to negotiate um, a trigger hair response? And if it is, we got a problem. Uh, you know, Congress has been quite reluctant to um, assert its constitutional authority on, on questions of war and peace. We've had, I think, since the, the Korean, we had, did not have a declaration of war during the Korean War, the Vietnam War, and many, most all of the conflicts subsequently. I think we had one declaration of war when we went to uh, war with Iraq and uh, during the first Gulf. War. So Congress generally keeps its fingers out of this whole business. Um, they don't want to take responsibility or the blame for things that go wrong when we dispatch armed forces around the world. I think that's one of the, the motives here. But you see, you see, we have a congressman and a senator who are trying to uh, define, uh, you know, the, the constraints on the president. And, um, and, to, and to require congressional participation in the decision to use nuclear weapons first. So, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a yeah, one, one, of the, one of the problems is that they're both Democrats, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah the, politi <laughs> the political prospects of this are, are vanishingly small uh, in this administration. But uh, who knows, that could change in the future. In the chart that you showed of the number of nuclear weapons uh, that the U.S. held, there were sort of two phases of reduction under the second Bush. Uh, and the second phase was the, the numbers were dropping very rapidly yeah. toward the end of his presidency, and uh, then reductions halted altogether. 
How did the reductions come about at all, and, and why did they stop? Well, you, well you, if you can remember the figure, it, it sort of gradually sloped down to about from 30,000 to 20,000 uh, at the end of the Cold War. This is the U.S. number of U.S. warheads. And then there was a, a big drop uh, under Bush 1. Uh, and this was really reflected primarily the, uh, it's called the bush Gorbachev unilateral initiatives to, to get rid of the so-called tactical nuclear weapons, the weapons with the armies and deployed with the Navy mostly. And, and, so, and that was about half of them in the case of the U.S. Uh, the, the second drop, um, which happened toward the end of the Bush II, was actually a congressional initiative, which is they, they were piling up. The warheads were piling up in, in, a, in a huge reserve. And Congress, actually it was Congressman David Hobson, who was the chairman of the uh, Energy and Water Subcommittee of the House Appropriations Committee, said, you know, why are you keeping those things around? You know, they, they, uh, they're, you know, they cost money. And so that was actually, uh, that's the story. And during a... Uh, Obama's administration maybe uh, it reduced by about a thousand or so, uh, and uh, you know that that also reflects the dynamics of a Democratic president with a Republican Congress, which is, which is just the reverse of the dy dynamics of a Republican president with a Democratic con Congress. With Republican presidents willing to do something on arms control, he, you know he gets lots of support from the from the Democratic Congress. Yeah, there was also a problem in the uh, context of um, of this in terms of U.S.-Russia relations, which um, which uh, bottomed out <laughs> a few years ago. Our, our the last nuclear strategic agreement that we reached with the Russians was with Medvedev, the and then they swapped seats. Putin took power. Uh, President Obama in 2013 proposed a Berlin, a Berlin proposal to cut by another one-third. Um, so we would have continued on that downward trend a little further, but uh, Putin re re rebuffed that offer, um, and uh, we haven't, you know, we haven't uh, managed to get things back on track. There's also, I think, a view within our nuclear planning establishment that there is there is sort of a it's hard to go down below a certain level. Mm -hmm. But a lot of this is driven by the number of weapons on the other side, um, and which justifies weapons on our side, which justifies the targeting of their weapons, etc. So it's a dynamic that if you get it sort of in a downward spiral, it sort of feeds on itself, and you can make cuts. But if it, if it plateaus, then it's kind of hard to get started again. And there's a uh, currently kind of a plateau and, and in the minds of nuclear planners, there's a requirement to destroy on the order of um, on the order of um, a thousand targets in Russia and 500 targets in China, mostly nuclear forces of the other side, but also lots of so-called military industrial targets. In other words, they're kind of factories, and cities mostly, as well as leadership targets. There, um, we, cur we currently have. Um, roughly 100 nuclear warheads aimed at the greater Moscow metropolitan area, and that's considered to be necessary uh, to, to 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 deter Russia. Um, it's it's sort of an overkill men mentality, but it is having the effect of keeping the levels propped up a bit. But we don't target populations per se. Uh, and I just realized that I that I had uh, I didn't complete my thought about the perversity of the of those missile defense, which has been one of the problems, uh, which it, which is that uh, uh, they almost surely they they would be neutralized, but the other side uh, makes you know worst case analyses as do we, and uh, and has and assumes that they might work. Uh, which which then uh, basically uh, prevents Russia from being willing to reduce further with an uncertain future for our ballistic, our buildup, which is ongoing. And China is, un, is for the same reason, unwilling to uh, to cap, to commit to cap its uh, its arsenal, which will 
which will uh, uh, ultimately cause problems, uh, limit the downward, how far down we could go with Russia if we could go down further. Uh, please. Uh, how much is known about the you know the same doomsday mechanism in Russia? I spent um, many many months in smoke-filled rooms searching this in, in the 1990s and have written a book on, on it. Um, it's a um, it's a very interesting system. It's very similar to ours, except that it has more checks um, um, on the. latitude of, of uh, operation at uh, subordinate levels of the chain of command. So we, we've tended largely to trust our military and the Russians have tended to distrust theirs and so they have in, <laughs> instituted very elaborate safeguards um, that uh, allow, uh, really prevent the, uh, the unauthorized use of nuclear weapons, but they have evolved a system very similar to ours that's based on quick launch on the basis of, of um, indications of an attack. There was a very serious false alarm in Russia in 1983 that uh, involved the apparent attack uh, by U.S. Minuteman missiles against Russia, <clears throat> a very dangerous event that could have, could have led to uh, an accident, a, a, a launch on false warning. We've also had an incident or two along those lines that have brought us very close to the brink of launching on false warning. So the two systems kind of evolved um, into a hair trigger posture. And the Russians right now from Moscow could uh, launch missiles out of silos in Siberia in 20 seconds. It's, uh, it's rigged for very, very quick launch in Russia, uh, not so much um, in uh, in the other nuclear countries, it's the U.S. and Russia right now that are poised on uh, uh, hair trigger alert. Is a um, EMP surprise attack uh, uh, seriously considered, and if so, is there a special protocol for dealing with an EMP attack? Um, a lot of the threat analysis that comes out of the community of, of nuclear planners is based on um, the possibility that there could be an early uh, attack, uh, early explosion of a nuclear weapon at high altitude that would that would generate electromagnetic pulse that would shut down communications and and and, and, and other things very uh, very quickly because uh, the weapon could be exploded on the upward trajectory of a missile. So uh, in, in a lot of the planning uh, for a Russian nuclear attack, it's assumed that there could be a, an early, like within three minutes of launch, electromagnetic pulse event that could, that could um, um, seriously degrade U.S. nuclear command and control, if not decapitate the um, system of command and control. We were trying to trying to work that problem by hardening communications and, and, and satellites and all the rest against radiation and electromagnetic pulse. But how well we succeeded in that project is hard to say because it's very very hard to really test the resilience, the uh, protection that we're providing uh, to these systems. So, to my knowledge. Um, there's no special protocol for for that event. I, I think it would be seen more today as uh, part and parcel of a larger attack that would be um, a, a threat that had to be dealt with. I, that, uh, I suspect that there is, uh, you know, some war gaming and planning it that considers the possibility of like, even one weapon detonated at high altitude that could that could black out uh, both military and civilian communications to a considerable degree across much of the country. Um, I really don't know this, the state of that uh, of that planning or how well we're going to go. Thank you. 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 Thank
I'm wondering what the main resistance is to swapping out the ICBMs for other warheads. Is it economic? Is it tactical? Uh, if these are, you know, posing, uh, they're the hair trigger, then uh, why can't we maintain our arsenal without having these? Well, the, the, the most survivable part of our stockpile, about, uh, about half of it, is, at, is in submarines at sea at any, at any one time. That, that is half, not half of the 4,000, but half of the, you know, about 1,500 strategic weapons. Uh, and uh, so we, we could increase. Um, the preferable would be to both sides would be to reduce, but we could do it unilaterally. We could increase the number of uh, warheads at sea, uh, uh, and uh, we would, which would make them, which would increase the survivable fraction of this. I, I myself think that the the vulnerability of the ICBMs, this, these uh, missile silos, is overdone in the sense that it would. They only each war uh, uh, our our missiles at sea, uh, you know, maybe typically have about six warheads on them. The missiles uh, in these silos have about one warhead on each, and it would require at least one warhead to destroy one warhead. So, so uh, the the incentive is is not very great there, and, I'm, and but uh, the for some reason it's assumed. That they would be targeted, uh, and uh, and and we get into this crazy hair trigger scenario. There's almost a theological commitment to having three legs of a triad: the submarines, the bombers, and these underground missiles. It's very hard to shake that that uh, theology. Um, and um, there, yeah, but there is a there is a uh, growing argument and and. Uh, Political force uh, to to eliminate the land base. This is uh, former Secretary Perry, for example, supports that. So does uh, General Cartwright, the former head of Strategic Command, and, and, and others. So um, there's you know some movement in that direction. General Mattis, who's the new Secretary of Defense, made an argument along the lines that Frank just made, which is that uh, these forces could serve as a sponge for for Russian nuclear warheads. He said it would take one, two, three, maybe even four Russian warheads to destroy one silo with very, very high reliability. And therefore, um, Russia could, would virtually exhaust all of its nuclear warheads in order to destroy one fourth of our arsenal. Um, but, you know, that's not a view that, that General Mattis is a Marine. He's never touched a nuclear weapon in his life. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't get his head and arms around them at all. And, it's not a view shared by nuclear planners. They want to destroy targets on the other side, and, um, and, and they, don't want, they don't want to play sponge games. They want to uh, be able to launch them first or on warning and destroy uh, many targets in, in Russia. And so you get, you get that sort of the planning momentum here, or inertia behind, uh, behind this as well. It, it gets crazy because uh, if both sides are on that posture, then you have missiles attacking empty silos. Uh, and, but, but I'm writing an article with a uh, colleague who was just in the White, came out of the White House, and he, he assures me that rather than de-alerting, which is, which is something that Bruce has been promoting for decades, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the strategic command would get rid of those ICBMs and so I think people have finally concluded, well, if that's the only option, let's get rid of them. Uh, please. Uh, I guess we've got, we're getting down to we're counting down, so maybe uh, this is the last couple. In uh, history, I read of the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. The claim was made that uh, some Soviet commanders of the uh, submarine had the authority to fire off nuclear missiles and one perhaps nearly did. Uh, is that true? And what's the situation now with respect to America, Russia, China, and other countries? So, yeah, I mean, this, the submarine commanders have, have the authority to use nuclear torpedoes. 
um, but not nuclear long-range strategic missiles. So tactical weapons, so-called small tactical weapons, uh, artillery shells and things like that, um, had had less uh, had fewer res restrictions on their use, and a lot of delegation of authority at the lowest level to to employ those forces. That a lot, that's um, largely changed. There has been a, I think, a very um, strong trend to lock up these weapons and re to require the receipt of unlock codes before they can be used at all levels, strategic and tactical. We didn't lock up our submarines until 1997. The crews technically had the ability to to fire our strategic missiles until 1997. Um, so, but the trend has been to, to lock them up and to restrict the authority very tightly over their use. But basically, basically limit the uh, authority to the highest levels of the chain of command. Do we have a couple of minutes to talk a little more about uh, false alarms? Where do they come from and how dangerous are they? You know, I mean, when you have when you have uh, weapons that are arm targeted, fueled, that are going to fire instantly out of the silos as soon as they receive they receive a short computer code, um, then you're dealing with missiles that are on a hair trigger, and then we have an operational protocol, as I described it, that's also um, checklist driven. It's scripted, and uh, it develops kind of a momentum of its own. If there are indications of an attack, um, it's, uh, there's not very much time to sort that out. And indeed, as I indicated, we've had several very serious false alarms on both sides. Uh, it continues to be a serious concern that's compounded by the possibility that early warning data could be corrupted by cyber intrusion, cyber attack. So um, I think it's a, a, a really, uh, important issue and something that we need to uh, work at to get rid of. Can I just, uh, I think, I'm, I'm correct, right, that we're, we're running, running out of time. Uh, the, the, right? The, 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 the purpose of this, this is called the day of action. And the, the purpose of this is to, uh, to, to uh, start discussions of what, what we can do. And so, uh, uh, there is, I, I think, uh, I, I understood that there was going to be a table coalition for peace action, the community group. Did they, do they have a table here? Did, I believe so. Yeah, um, they, on the main floor. Anyway, that's a very good, there's a very good community group here, uh, which works on these issues. Uh, if, if people want to work with them, if people want to think about uh, their own thing, uh, you know, both Bruce and I are available to to brainstorm uh, about, uh, you know, about what we, we could do to uh, in influence. Uh, uh, there are some strong uh, yep. citizen movements underway. I mean, I'll mention two. One is my own. I co-founded Global Zero, which is an international movement for the elimination of nuclear weapons. Go to the website, globalzero.org. We, we have uh, hundreds of volunteers. Uh, around the world, mostly in the United States, and we uh, really appreciate the, the support and participation of people in that. The mission is to push the nuclear weapons countries to begin a process of negotiation for the elimination of nuclear weapons, so we're pressuring, pressuring them. There's another movement, uh, it's also international, it's a ban movement. Uh, in fact, it's, a, it's really gaining momentum in the United Nations where there's a negotiation beginning in March uh, to negotiate a treaty. 123 countries are involved for, uh, to, to uh, reach a treaty that bans nuclear weapons. And, um, and, um, and Tamara Patton, in the back of the room, is the person to contact on, on that and support you, that movement. I think there was a session this morning on that, right? Yes. Yeah. And we'll also be meeting um, just after this session for anyone who wants to hear more about that topic. The UN movement? Yeah. Uh, so, Tamara, what, what's the call? The oh, ban movement? Or? The, the ban movement. The, um, 
movement on the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons is another term for it. Um, but again, it's um, an international movement um, looking at the humanitarian effects of nuclear weapons and um, trying to create a new international norm around um, uh, prohibiting nuclear weapons uh, through, uh, again, the UN uh, Gener General Assembly process. Is there going to be a march or something like that in, at the first UN session on that? So the negotiations begin on the 27th and go for one week, and then there's going to be an intercession um, into the summer. And when the second session starts in June, there's going to be a, a women's march. It's called Women's March to Ban the Bomb on June 18th, um, and it's going to be in New York. Um, you can look it up on Facebook to find the route, and um, again, anyone, all are welcome. Okay, well, thank you very much, everybody.